Welcome to Video Podcast uh, number 85. I'm spoiling you all. Spoiling you all. This might be my last video for at least a week. I'm spoiling you all. Giving you all these videos. I done did like what? One, two, three. This will be my fourth video in a week. And if you notice, in the last couple of months, I ain't did that many free videos in that short span of time. Matter of fact, prior to last Monday, I was only doing about one free video a week, usually on Mondays. But starting with last Monday, I did a video, free video last Monday. I did one Thursday. I did one Saturday, which is extremely rare for me. As I mentioned in my last video, that's only the second, no more than third time I've ever done a video on a Saturday. And now I'm doing one today. So this will be my fourth video since last Monday. My fourth free video since last Monday. Um, I think I made this announcement already, but I'm going to make it again. I'm going to be doing traveling, as I do quite a bit for one-on-one -on -one face to face coaching I'm going to be in San Francisco on March 1st and March 2nd and then I'm going to be in Los Angeles on March 3rd, 4th and 5th I'm going to be in San Francisco on March 1st and March 2nd then I'm going to be in Los Angeles on March 3rd, 4th and 5th and I already have one client lined up in each city, at least one, but I have openings for it, at least one more. I have an opening for at least one more client in San Francisco. Matter of fact, I've already been contacted by a couple guys who live in the Bay Area, and I got two slots open in Los Angeles. So if you live in either the Los Angeles area or Northern California, what's known as the Bay Area, the Oakland slash San Francisco area, then write me a note at coaching at mo1.net. I don't have a three-day session open in either city. I have three one-on-one -on -one sessions. I have a four-hour, one-day session, an eight-hour session, which can be either in one day or covered over two days, and then I have a 14-hour session that's covered over three days. Um, so out of those three sessions, the, the four hour, eight hour, and 14 hour session, San Francisco, I have one slot open for a four hour session. I have one slot open for a four hour session. And in LA, I have either two, two four hour slots open or possibly even one eight hour and one four hour session open. Or if not that, two four-hour sessions open. So, again, write me on coaching at mo1.net. Now, as you know, some of my video podcasts are kind of, um, what I'm going to say. Uh, well, first, I forgot. This is my favorite flavor of this carbonated soda that has no sugar. Because I think I mentioned this before. Before I discovered this stuff, Zevia, I, I, I had stopped drinking soda pop. I hadn't drinking soda pop since like the late 90s, early 2000s. Because it either had sugar in it or because the diet sodas had this artificial sweetener called aspartame, which is very dangerous to your body. So I stopped drinking soda pop altogether. But then a friend introduced me to Zevia. It has no sugar. And it the art of, the sweetener it uses is a natural sweetener. There's two types of sweeteners. There's artificial sweeteners and there's natural sweeteners. A natural sweetener is stevia extract. Stevia extract. That's the, a lot of people consider that the best sweetener on the market. 
um, if you don't want sugar in your drink. Anyway, it's pretty good. But this stuff makes me burp a lot. Any Anything carbonated is going to make you burp. So be prepared. I have a new article in the comments section that came out today on the Negro Manosphere that relates to probably my last four videos. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Some videos I do are just what I would call a self self-contained video meaning it covers one independent subject and it's not related to the video before it or it's not really related to the video after it it's, it's kind of self-contained then there's other videos I've had including my last four that are all kind of interrelated to each other they're kind of interrelated that's how my last four videos have been they've been all interrelated to each other um, and anyway, my article today in the Negro Manosphere is about red pill rage. Something a lot of men experience. There's at least two stages related to the red pill. The first stage is becoming red pill aware, which you could say a lot of my last four videos have contributed to guys becoming more red pill aware of women's true nature. And then, as I mentioned also in another video, some guys, when they become red pill aware, it's no big deal to them. That ain't no big deal to them. Other guys, honestly, become traumatized once they become red pill aware. It kind of like fucks them up. Like the analogy I used in my article today, I said for some guys, it's like the dating and relationships equivalent to finding out there is no Santa Claus. I mean, there's some kids, when you're young, once they find out there's no Santa Claus, they kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of felt that way anyway. But there's, there's other kids, man, that literally will start crying and shit. <laughs> I've heard some horror stories about when kids found out there was no Santa Claus. Yeah, for a lot of kids, man, that, that kind of fucks them up for a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. It's a combination of two things. One, the fact that somebody that they thought was real is not real. And then even equally, if not more profoundly, the fact that usually it was one of their own parents, if not both of their parents, that lied to them. So that's what kind of fucks up a lot of children. they like, why would my parents lie to me and tell me there was a Santa Claus and a tooth fairy and there is no such thing as a fucking... Santa Claus is too fair. Why would they lie to me like that? You know, a lot of kids resent their parents for lying to them like that. As well as society in general. Because, you know, society plays into those lies for the tooth fairy and Santa Claus. Well, that's the same thing with Red Pill. If you're a man and you had your mother give you the impression... Well, somebody in my comment section made a good point that I generally agree with. One commenter said, one of the reasons why a lot of mothers mislead their sons about the nature of women is because if they themselves used to be really kinky and really promiscuous, they don't want their son to know that because they know their son ain't going to be able to handle that shit. And if, if you read, I'm again, plug my book, The Bait of My Revolution, you know I actually say that in The Bait of My Revolution. I say one of the reasons why a lot of men have an adverse reaction to marrying women who, who have a promiscuous past is not so much for their own sake. Some men is for their own sake. Other men, they don't so much care themselves if their wife used to be promiscuous but they don't want if they were to have a son they don't want their son to find out that their mother used to be promiscuous because it is you know it's been documented that a lot of men can't handle that man matter of fact that plays into Dr. Sigmund Freud's whole concept of the Madonna horror complex he talks about that he says one of the reasons 
why men hold some women on a pedestal as a Madonna or a good girl is because he said no man wants to wants to look at their own mother as being kinky or promiscuous. Most men can't handle that. There's some men who can, but generally speaking, most men can't handle the idea of their mother being a big ass freak. Like most men don't even like to think of their mother as being fucked or sucking dick or anything like that shit. I mean, that's just that's just real talk, man. Most men, the vast majority of men, they don't they don't want to. Like I was watching an interview recently. Uh, the actor Michael B. Jordan, he was on Ellen. Ellen DeGeneres and they were talking about something and somehow nudity came into the conversation and Ellen mentioned something about his mother being nude and Michael B. Jordan kind of like cringed. He was like, ugh. He was like, I don't even want to think about my mother being naked. That's how a lot of men are with their, with their mothers, man. Like, I noticed there's a difference between men and women. Like, I knew a lot of women who've had promiscuous fathers and even adulterous fathers and that didn't fuck with them too much. A few women maybe, but most women, most women can handle the fact that their father either was promiscuous while he was married to their mother or at minimum they can handle the fact that he was promiscuous before he met their mother, that woman's mother. But sons, most sons, man, they can't handle that shit. <laughs> That's real talk. Most sons, man, they they can't handle the idea of of their mother being promiscuous, or whether it was during the marriage with their father, or even coming into the marriage um, with their father. Most men like to think of their their mothers as being the ultimate good girl. Now it just so happened with me, my mother actually genuinely was. Like, like her nickname in college was the Elegant Prude. Everybody who knew my mother in college categorized her as very prudish. But again, her behavior wasn't that much of an exception to the norm in her day because most women were good girls. Now speaking on this, I've had some men make some comments that I disagree with. Some men have made comments to the fact that essentially that any woman with a promiscuous past is unfit for marriage. I I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. And we're all entitled to our opinions, but I'm just letting you know, I don't agree with that. Here's what I agree with. If you were to say, I don't think any woman who currently currently has highly promiscuous tendencies is not fit for a monogamous marriage that's kind of like duh of course I, so I agree with that if you meet a woman today and you want a long term relationship with her or you want to be married to her in a monogamous manner but she's confessed to you or you find out through one of her male or female friends that she has a highly promiscuous nature, then yeah, I would agree that woman is not fit for you to be married for the obvious reason that you want a monogamous relationship with this woman. So I agree with that. But when it comes to a woman having a promiscuous past, like let's say today you met a woman that was 35 years old and that woman was to confess to you that when she was between 17 and 23, she was very promiscuous. But beginning with her 23rd or 24th birthday, she began avoiding casual sex completely and she only engaged in sex with men who were her long-term boyfriend. I, w I wouldn't agree with the idea that that woman is not fit for marriage. I know a lot of women with promiscuous past who are married today. I know women like that I went to high school and college with that I know for a fact used to be promiscuous. And they're now happily married, got kids. Matter of fact, I said on one episode, video episode last year, to be quite frank with you, when I think about women I went to college with, I know more women that I went to college with 
who had a reputation for being kinky and promiscuous in college that are now married than the women who were the quote-unquote good girl types. A lot of the women I went to college with that had a reputation for being prudish good girls, a lot of them never get married. They either never get married, or if they get married, they were divorced within a year or two later. So, for all you guys who have this, this, this assumption or this impression that the more a woman is a good girl, the more she's fit for marriage, I would have to argue with you. I would debate you on that. Again, based on women I went to college with, I know way more good girl type women that have had marital problems than women who were promiscuous. Again, a lot of the women I knew in college that were promiscuous or at least semi-promiscuous, they're now happily married. They got them a husband. They got kids, everything. They're happily married. There's a few that ended up getting divorced, but most of them, they, they got married and stayed married. But yeah, man, a lot of the good girl type chicks I went to college with, a lot of them never got married. They never got married. They've been single all their life. I know a lot of men who have told me directly, they don't want to marry no woman that's like a, a virgin or a woman who's very sexually inexperienced. There's a lot of men, believe it or not, that prefer to marry women who've had their share of sexual experiences with men. Oh, I know, I know. You want to know a movie? And I, if you read my original Mall One book, I, there's some movies I recommend. i tell you the best movie that centers on the whole Madonna horror complex issue. That arguably the best movie I've seen and there's probably maybe a few movies I don't know that might deal with the subject directly and indirectly but best movie I've seen is called Chasing Amy I'm sure a lot of you older guys have seen that movie at least one that was the first movie I ever saw Ben Affleck in like I didn't know who Ben Affleck was until I saw Chasing Amy that was the very first movie that introduced me to Ben Affleck. Because I, I wasn't familiar with Ben Affleck before I saw Chasing Amy. That's arguably... Matter of fact, the writer and director of that movie, he owns a copy of Mo One. He owns a copy of Mo One. Uh, Kevin Smith. There's actually a few celebrities that own a copy of my book. Um, John Favreau, who was in Swingers. He was the director of Iron Man and Iron Man 2. He owns a copy of Mo One. Jeremy Pivens used to be on uh, um, Entourage. Owns a copy of Mo One. I knew to turn my phone off. Damn shame, I gotta unplug all my phones and shit. Um, yeah, there's a few celebrities. Matter of fact, I mentioned this before, once or twice. I remember one time, you know me, I like to address my haters and critics a lot of times. And one time I was on this site that's now defunct, it's called PUA Hate where guys would go to complain about pickup artists, dating coaches, as well as women. And one day I was on there, basically some guys were, you know, basically being haters and, and critics. And Tariq Nasheed, the former dating advisor who's now more so a, a urban activist, He criticized me through the inbox message because he happened to be on there at the same time. And he was like, Alan, man, why are you, why are you wasting time, man? You know, offering responses and rebuttals to all these haters and critics, man. He's like, man, fuck them, man. Fuck them. But as I explained to him, and I explained to a lot of people, one of the reasons why I used to address my haters and critics on PUA hate was not so much for the haters and critics. But there was a lot of lurkers, what was known on message board terminology, lurkers. 
There are a lot of lurkers on PUA8. A lurker is somebody who visits the site a lot, but they don't actually post on it. They just come to read post. Man, I, I, I scored a lot of email consultation purchases, Skype and telephone consultation purchases from those lurkers, man. That's why I used to go on PUA8. See, a lot of people I thought I was just going on there just from, you know, because I was bored and didn't have nothing else to do. Shoot. <laughs> Y'all underestimate my business savvy. I was making money on PUA hate. I got a I, I recruited a lot of email consultation clients and Skype and telephone consultation clients from PUA hate. From the lurkers. But anyway, but Tariq Nashi, one of the comments he made, he said, Man, you shouldn't be on PUA hate, man. He said, Man, I run into Hollywood celebrities, man, who mention your books. And technically, I kind of already knew that because, as I already mentioned, there are celebrities I know for a fact who own my book. But it was kind of flattering hearing that from him. He said, yeah, man. He said, I've run into a lot of people in the entertainment industry, man, who have told me. They say, yeah, man, Alan Roger Curry's book, Mo One, is all that, man. I read Alan Roger Curry's book, Mo One. So that was kind of cool for him to let me know that. Um, but... Oh, I was talking about Chasing Amy, man. That's a good movie, man. That's a good movie, man. I'm going to try to give you the gist without giving you too many spoilers, but I know myself, I'm going to inevitably give you a spoiler or two. So, I would say once you feel like I'm starting to give a spoiler, you might want to pause the video and maybe fast forward 30 to 60 seconds or whatever. Um... Matter of fact, I'm going to give, this is what I'm going to do for this video. I'm going to give a few movie recommendations for this video. Movies that I either think relate to stuff I've talked about in my last four videos, or just movies that I think either directly or indirectly relate to stuff I talk about in all of my videos, in all of my books. But I'll start off with Chasing. Chasing Amy, man, that's, again, that's the best movie that deals with the issue of m men suffering from the Madonna horror complex. It stars Ben Affleck and uh, I forget the lead female character's real name in real life, but that movie came out in 1997. 1997. And again, it was written and directed by a guy named Kevin Smith. And what made me think of that movie, because I was telling you that a lot of men, there's some men who don't mind marrying a woman who has, who's had a promiscuous past, while there's other men who, if you put a gun in their head, they wouldn't marry a woman. And at the end of that movie, Chasing Amy, man, Kevin Smith, he's in the movie, the writer and director, he plays this character named Silent Bob. And he's actually in the movie. And he actually breaks some shit down at the end of the movie. First, I'll give you the gist of the gist of movie. Ben Affleck meets this woman that he's attracted to. And she tells him that she's a lesbian. But later on, she confesses that she's basically what I would refer to as a voluntary lesbian. Voluntary lesbian. What do I mean when I say voluntary lesbian? See, there's a lot of people in the gay and lesbian community that will have you believe that all men who are gay are born gay, and all women who are lesbians are born lesbians. I hate to say this, and I know a lot of people from the, the LBQT community will get mad at me, but the reality is, man, there's a lot of women who in their life chose to become lesbians. They weren't born lesbians. They used to deal with men. Like, I met a lot of women like that when I lived in Los Angeles. I can't tell you how many women I met in Los Angeles who were in that category. That women who started off being totally heterosexual and then they said because they became disillusioned with men, you could say arguably they became red pill aware to do with men's true nature. They said they just stopped dealing with men. They chose to stop dealing with men. And they, they, be, they voluntarily became lesbians. Anyway, going back to Chasing Amy, that's how this woman was. And so anyway, Ben Affleck and her start dating and at first it seems like everything's going well and then <laughs> there's one scene I want to say he's going to this like kind of 7-Eleven type store 
and he runs into two guys that his new girlfriend went to high school with. And they like, I can't remember her name in the movie. Let's call her Alyssa. They're like, hey man, you dating Alyssa? And Ben Affleck is like, yeah. And then they like, just look at each other and they start smirking and shit. And Ben Affleck's like, you know, like, what's up? And they're like, hey man, I hate to tell you this, man, but your girl, man, in high school, your girl was a big ass freak. She used to come to like lunchtime orgies we had. She would take turns sucking our dick. She was just like a big ass freak. And Ben, man, I'm telling you, man, this movie, man, I love this movie. Because it's so real, man. You know, there's some movies I don't really enjoy because I feel like they're too Hollywoodish. Then there's other movies that I feel really like the portrayal of the characters are resonate with me because I feel like they're very realistic. And Ben Affleck's reaction to hearing about his girlfriend being a freak in high school was real, man. Because, again, man, a lot of guys can't handle that shit, man. A lot of guys can't handle that shit. I would, I would, I would almost guarantee you that a lot of you guys listening to me and watching this video right now know good and well that if y'all met a woman that you were really attracted to, that you thought would make good long-term girlfriend material or future wife material, and then a few weeks from now or a few months from now, you found out that that woman used to be really promiscuous in high school and or college, there's a 90 to 99 percent chance you're going to lose immediately, lose interest in it. You're going to be like, oh, no, I got to break up with her. I didn't know she was a fucking freak. I didn't know she was a big-ass kinky freak. A lot of me, I'm telling you, I've seen male friends and acquaintances of mine have that type of reaction. That meet a woman, first they'll be into that woman, then once they find out that that woman had a promiscuous past, they're like, oh, no, I can't continue to fuck with her no more. Anyway, that's how Ben Affleck was, man. He like he can't handle that man. He like he like fucks him up, man. But here's the thing at the end of the movie, and this is a spoiler. So again, if you don't want to hear it, pause and, and fast forward. But Kevin Smith as um Silent Bob, he basically breaks down one of the major reasons why most men can't handle a woman with a promiscuous past. And I, and I agree with his assessment. I don't remember his exact dialogue, but what he basically says is, he says, like, say you've met a woman. I'm, I'm, this is not his exact words. I'm just paraphrasing essentially what he said. But he basically is like, say you meet a woman and say before you, she's had sex with 19 guys prior to meeting you. And you're basically her 20th guy that she ends up having sex with. And he said, now, he basically said, all women have their, their internal ranking system. So they're going to know after they have sex with you two or three times where you fall. Like, are you their number one favorite lover, their best lover ever? Are you their second best lover ever? Are you the third best lover ever? Are you number 12? Are you number 15? Are you number 19? And what he goes on to say is that most men are afraid that if they're, say, a woman's 20th lover, they don't want to be ranked number 15, number 16, number 17, number 18, number 19, and number 20, because then that means they know that there's, you know, 14 guys that in that woman's mind are ranked higher than them. And that that woman is probably going to reminisce on how good those other guys' dicks were. Whereas he said on the flip side, like, let's say you're, you're also a guy who you meet a woman and you're her 20th lover in her life. And let's say after having sex with her five times, she ends up ranking you as either her best of all time or second best of all time. See, you're not really going to care about those 18 or 19 men that are below you. <laughs> if, you're, he basically said, if you're ranked high on the list, then you don't really give a fuck about her being promiscuous because you know there's... All her 18 or 19 other lovers are ranked below you. But if you're a woman's 20th lover, and after two or three times having sex with that woman, you realize that essentially she has 17, 18 guys ranked above you, then that's going to fuck with your ego. That's going to fuck with your ego. And if you hook up with a virgin, you're guaranteed to be that woman's best lover because you're her only lover. <laughs> 
You're our only lover. And I, I know some of you watching this might disagree with that, but I agree with that. I don't agree with that as the only reason that men have a problem with women having a promiscuous past. But I definitely think that's in the top two or three major reasons why women have, why men have a problem with women with promiscuous past. Because, yeah, they don't, they don't want a woman to still have fond memories of some guy that really gave them some really good dick. I know Ron Wills. He talks about that. Him and one other podcast, so they talk about this concept known as the womb imprint. The womb imprint. Where they basically say that a woman is always going to think about at least two guys in her life. She's always going to think about two guys in her life. Her best fuck and her first fuck. <laughs> That's what a lot of people believe. I think, I'm, I hope I'm not misquoting Ron Wells and other people about that. I don't know all the ins and outs of the concept of the womb imprint, but I want to say it essentially comes down to that women are always going to think about at least two guys, their first fuck and their best fuck. So in, other, in, order, in order to leave a truly indelible impression on a woman's mind, you got to be one of those two. You got to either be her first fuck and or her best fuck, or at least one of her top two to three best fucks, to really leave an impression on a woman's mind. But anyway, yeah, chasing Amy, that's why Kevin Smith's character says um, why most men can't handle a woman who's had multiple dicks in a pussy, because they there's always going to be a 50% chance that they're going to be ranked on the lower end of the, the scale than, as opposed to in her top two or three favorite lovers. Um, matter of fact, that's why I mentioned this guy interviewed on my blog talk radio show named Carl E. Stevens Jr. He goes by another name, Rakim Saku. He wrote this article that really caught my eye uh, about three or four years ago, where he, he basically said that, because you know, he's in an open marriage. This same guy I'm talking about, he's in an open marriage. And he wrote this article where he said, only egotistically secure alpha males are in a position to share pussy. He said, if you're an egotistically insecure beta male, you, you're never going to be enthusiastic about sharing pussy. Whereas he said, if you, and his, his, his main justification for that or reason for that, he said, in so many words, he basically said, if you know you're a damn good lover, you don't have a problem sharing pussy because you know that pussy is going to come back to you. <laughs> You know that pussy ain't really going nowhere. You know it's coming back to you. Whereas he said, if you a a beta male who has less than average sex skills, then you don't want to share pussy because you know, if, say, if if you let your girlfriend fuck some other dude who who fucks and ends up fucking her five times better than you, she ain't never coming back to you. <laughs> that's true. That's real talk right there. I mean, a lot of you guys can't handle that type of talk, but that's real talk right there, man. That's real talk. Now, that was a real article he wrote. Um, so that's one movie I would recommend. And I'm going to spend like the next 20, 25 minutes offering some more of my movies that I think relate to either the, the content of my books or the content of my video podcast. So one I would highly recommend is Chasing Amy. And again, the main topic that deals with is the Madonna... How men negatively, men who, who who suffer from the negative effects of the Madonna horror complex. That's what that movie deals with. Oh, speaking of Ron Wills, I mentioned Ron Wills. He recommended a movie a couple weeks ago on his YouTube channel called Honey Trap. Ooh. Ooh. Matter of fact, I don't know if some of y'all should watch Honey Trap. That, that movie might traumatize you. And I'm only saying that half lightheartedly. That's a deep movie, man. So I give props to Ron Wills for cluing me into it. I never heard of that movie until I heard Ron Wills talking about it. Um, it's based on, a number one, it's based on a real-life incident. So it's not totally fictional. It's based on real-life events that happened in London. <coughs> I told Ron... That movie really profoundly affected me because 
I have a younger cousin who found himself in a situation similar to the character in Honey Trap, and he lost his life because of it. He lost. I had a younger cousin who lost his life because of a situation similar to the situation in Honey Trap. To give you the gist of that movie, it's about this really attractive high schooler. She moves to London from, I think, the Caribbean Islands. No, Trinidad. Yeah, she moves. Yeah, she moves to London from Trinidad. She has a lot of family dysfunction going on. And first she meets this nice guy named Sean. Come on. Okay, Honey Trap, that was made in 2014 and okay yeah she meets she meets this guy named Sean let's call him the nice guy type beta male type then she around the same time she meets this more pretty boy rapper with a lot of streetwise sensibilities named Troy and you can tell she's immediately enamored by Troy you know this is the, the, the common scenario of the bad boy jerk versus the polite nice guy gentleman type deal and without getting into too much of details of the story man here's where Sean made his mistake the nice guy character Again, who's and all this is based on real life shit. You know how, how I am about fun club. You know how I always talk about you should never fun club a woman. And for those of you ignorant to that term, fun clubbing. Fun clubbing is anytime you're a man <coughs> and you're temporarily or indefinitely pretending like you're content with being a woman's purely platonic friend, even though you know deep down that you want to date that woman or engage in casual sex with that woman, excuse me. That's fun clubbing. This, Sean, the character in this movie, he pays the price for fun clubbing, man. He pays the price for fun clubbing, I'll just say that. I'll leave it at that. Um, Tyler Perry movie called The Family That Prays with Sina, Sina, specific emphasis on Sanai Lathan's character. You know, I wrote an article about cuckolds. And I said, part of the formal definition of a cuckold is a man whose wife is not only cheating on him, but she get pregnant by another motherfucker. Yeah, man. If you watch The Family That Prays, there's a character, Sanai Lathan's husband. He got cuckolded. Not in the BDSM manner, but in the formal definition of the word. Excuse me, I told you, burp number one, if not number two. Hmm. Burp number three. Yeah, man, he got cuckoo. So that's that's another movie I would recommend watching. Tyler Perry's The Family That Prays. That came out in 2008. Um, Temptation. Speaking of Tyler Perry. Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor. Now, it's funny, the critics hated this movie. And a lot of black women I know hated this movie. Even a lot of black men I know said they didn't particularly care for it. Dude, that, that's, that's a good movie, man. I would recommend watching it. Man, the gist of that movie is about this woman. She was a marriage counselor. And she has a good husband, man. Good husband. Good brother is a husband, man. And it's basically, she just she meets this rich womanizer man who loves to snort cocaine and shit. Basically, a bad boy, rich womanizer type guy, and she ends up just he seduces her man, and she ends up cheating on her husband with this dude man. 
to the point where she is literally willing to ruin her marriage for this this, this bad boy womanizer, man. It's, 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 it's fucked up, man. It's I think every man should watch that movie, man. Yeah, I think every man should watch that. That's, yeah, so that'd be another movie on my recommendation list. Is uh, it's called Temptation: Confessions of a Marriage Counselor. It's a Tyler Perry movie. Um. Oh, I tell you, a movie. Man, I, I recommend this movie to a couple friends. They couldn't even. They couldn't even finish watching this movie. Movie called Pet, just simply Pet, stars this guy who was in one of those Lord of the Rings movies, Dominique something. Uh, here's the claim to fame. This movie, this movie, when it came out, it had the lowest box office at the time it came out. It had the lowest box office of any movie ever released, like ever, literally ever. It had the lowest box office intake at the movie theaters of any movie that had ever come out in movie history. And I can understand why I do this. That movie will fuck you up, man. That movie will fuck you up. I ain't even give too many details on that movie, man. I, I would say most of y'all even probably shouldn't watch that movie, man. That, that movie's gonna fuck you up. Um, Two Lovers. Two Lovers is a movie I always recommend to a lot of guys. Um, it stars Yoquan Phoenix and Gwyneth Paltrow. And the gist of this movie, Yoquan Phoenix, he's, he's in a relationship actually with this woman that he doesn't want to marry. His mother and father want him to marry the daughter of one of their friends. So they're basically like kind of setting him up to marry this chick. But he's really not into the chick. So he's first living with his parents, but he moves out into his own apartment to kind of clear his head and basically decide whether or not he, he wants to marry this woman or not. And so when he moves into his new apartment to kind of, you know, have some space of his own, he ends up crossing paths with Gwyneth Paltrow and he falls for Gwyneth Paltrow hard. Like, he's really into Gwyneth Paltrow. And she's being strung along by this married dude who keeps telling her that he's going to divorce her wife to be with her. But he keeps reneging on that. And without getting into any more details or spoilers, they, well, basically it comes down to this. It's a classic, fun club, another fun clubbing situation. Where Yo Kwan basically makes the mistake of, of at least temporarily fun clubbing with Gwyneth Paltrow. But she ain't really feeling him that way, man. She ain't feeling him that way. She looks at him just kind of like a play brother, like, you know, a friend. And she ends up breaking his heart at, by the end of the movie, man. So that's another movie that's worth watching. I'll tell you another movie with Yo Kwan Phoenix that's interesting. Is a movie called Her. Here's what's the kicker of this movie. I always talk about women who are manipulative and they end up playing dudes. He gets played by a woman that's not even a woman. It's a fucking computer, man. <laughs> you gotta watch this movie called Her, man. He falls in love with this, this, this operating system that has a female voice to it. Like... Imagine, like, let's say your operating system is Windows 10. And just imagine it. You know how, like, now they have, like, Siri with the iPhone? They have the voice of Siri. Like, I have um, Alexa's voice. Alexa, who is Alan Roger Curry? Alexa, who is Alan Roger Curry? Alan Roger Curry is an American dating coach self-help author, motivational speaker, and YouTube personality. Thank you. So, just like you heard that kind of computerized voice, and they have, a lot of computer devices do have these female voices now. Like, I, I have Cortana on one of my computers. Um, I think Google has a voice now. Um, anyway, 
in this movie called Her. It's just simply called Her. It was uh, in 2013. Yeah, man. <laughs> you just gotta watch that movie again. Ultimately, man, he get, he gets played by a computer, man. Of all things, he gets played. By, oh, I heard they another movie along those lines. Ex Machina. Ex Machina. Gotta watch Ex Machina. What year did that come out? Oh, man, yeah. Ex Machina, man. 2014. Watch Ex Machina. For all you guys, like, I'm hearing guys in social media talking about the concept of female sex bots, like female sexual robots that you can have sex with. Okay, this if, if you're a man who's really hyped about these sex robots, watch Ex Machina. That's all I got to say. Watch Ex Machina. That movie is going to make you think twice about hooking up with a female sexual robot. Watch Ex Machina. Seriously. Because I've been hearing a lot of talk about these fucking female sex bots. Watch Ex Machina, man. So that's another movie. Um, what else? Um, Oh, the ultimate movie about a beta male just getting his heart broken and getting played. I, I'd almost have to rank this as the movie of movies in that category. And somebody mentioned it in my comment section. The Last American Virgin. The Last American Virgin. That was made in, uh, I think, 1982. Yeah, man. Last American Virgin, man. That's the ultimate cautionary tale for beta males of almost any movie ever made that's the ultimate cautionary tale for beta males that sends the message don't be a fun clubbing naive beta male last american virgin man the end of that movie just like probably broke every beta male heart who ever watched that movie so that's another on Alan Roger Curry's movie recommendation list. Um, so what I got now so far, I got Chasing Amy, uh, Honey Trap, which was a Ron Wills recommendation, um, Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor, Her, Two Lovers, The Family That Prays, Pet, Last American Virgin. I'll tell you another movie. That's kind of a, a, a cautionary tale for beta males. Blue Valentine with uh, your boy Ryan Gosling. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Some of y'all ain't going to be able to handle that movie. That'll make... It, anybody who watches that movie going to make every beta male don't, not going to ever want to get married. And you know, it's funny because it just shows you the range, of uh, acting range. That's a term in acting this. If you can play a wide variety of characters, they'll say you have wide range. Like, if you're only able to play this type of character or that type of character, that means you have limited range as an actor. But if you can play a wide assortment of different characters, that means you have wide range as an actor. And see, Ryan Gosling, usually when he's in a movie that deals with male-female relationships, he's usually more of an alpha male character in his movies. Like, for example... Crazy Stupid Love. He played an alpha male in that movie. He was like a womanizer in that movie. But in Blue Valentine, man, Ryan Gosling plays the ultimate married beta male. <sighs> man, I don't know what to say about that movie, man. I wrote an examiner article about that movie. I said, I, at the time, yeah, when I wrote an Examiner article about that movie, I said, I thought that that movie might have been the most real-to-life, harshest, depressing movie I've ever seen that falls under the category of being in beta male hell, which is a common manos manosphere term, beta male hell. Man, Blue Valentine, yeah, you got to watch that movie, man. <laughs> that movie's that movie's fucked up. A lot of these movies I'm telling you about they have a some type of fucked up ending. Like like Honey Trap has a real fucked up ending. And again, that's based on real life. Blue Valentine has a fucked up ending. Um Two Lovers has a fucked up ending. 
Um, I'll tell you another movie with a fucked up ending. Red Shoe Diaries. I talked about this in my Patreon, one of my Patreon exclusive videos. Red Shoe Diaries. Now, the difference between Red Shoe Diaries, it wasn't a movie that was at the movie theater. It was a made-for-cable television movie. It came on Showtime. I watched it way back in the 90s. That's a movie that doesn't so much, well, yeah, it still, I guess, still does with beta males. But, you know, one of my most reoccurring themes is about the theme of women being sexually duplicitous, which I first found out from two porno movies, Talk Dirty to Me and Talk Dirty to Me Part 2. That's when I first thoroughly learned the concept of women being sexually duplicitous. Well, I say a non-porn movie that emphasizes that theme is a movie with David Duchovny of X-Files fame called Red Shoe Diaries. Came out, I think, 1992. Yeah, man. I don't want to give too many spoilers on that movie, but that might be arguably the best non-porn movie I've seen that deals with the theme of a woman's sexual duplicity. It's about this beautiful woman that's engaged to David Duchovny. And David Duchovny, he's not a total beta male, but he's kind of like, I would probably rank him in this movie as probably 60% beta, 40% alpha. And she meets this other guy who's a, a shoe salesman who's more like 90% alpha. And he's very masculine, very seductive, and he ends up seducing her, man. And so, well, I guess now I'm giving away details and potential spoilers, but yeah, basically she ends up cheating on her fiance, David the company, with this shoe salesman, man. But then she can't take it no more because she can't handle the fact that she's cheating on... I ain't going to give you the ultimate spoiler, but... Yeah, uh, I'll just tell you, it has a fucked up ending, man. So that's a movie I would recommend. I'm recommending to you all these movies with fucked up endings. But they're real movies, man. A lot of these movies, I'm telling you, they got fucked up endings. But they, they if you're a naive and or delusional type guy, these movies will wake you up. to the re, to the to These are what I would call red pill aware movies. All of the movies I'm mentioning to you would fall in the category of Red Pill Aware Movies. So yeah, Red Shoe Diaries. I, I'm going to try to uh, post a link of all these movie recommendations in my comment section. It'll probably take me a little while, but I'm going to post a link of all the movies that I'm recommending um, in my comment section. Um, I'll tell you a movie about, you know, I got one of my four archetypes of women I talk about. Reciprocators, rejectors, wholesome pretenders slash erotic hypocrites, and manipulative time wasters. I'll tell you a type of movie that deals with manipulative time wasters. Havoc. Movie called Havoc with Anne Hathaway. The actress Anne Hathaway. Man, when you watch that movie, you'll understand why some men get hit with false date rape charges. That movie... That's a good movie. That's a very underrated movie, man. But, yeah, that movie deals with the archetype of women that I refer to as manipulative time wasters, which includes attention whores and cock teasers. Yeah, Anne Hathaway and her, her high school classmate, they're the ultimate attention whores slash cock teasers, man. Yeah, that's a very underrated film, man. That's a good film. It's called Havoc, H-A-V-O-C. Um... Movie called Spread with Ashton Kutcher. Spread. Man, he gets played in that movie. He starts off, you think he's this major, smooth, seductive player type, but by the end of the movie, he gets played. So that's another movie that's worth watching. Um, I mentioned wholesome, my archetype of wholesome pretenders. Movie that, that features a wholesome pretender is Vicky Cristina Barcelona. Matter of fact, another reason to watch that movie, Javier Barnum's character, he's Mo One. He there's a scene towards the beginning of the movie where he's just straight up Mo One in a non profane, non X rated manner. He's Mo One. 
he basically approaches Scarlett Johansson and the actress Rebecca Hall and just basically tells them straight up that he wants to have a threesome with them. And Rebecca Hall ends up being a wholesome pretender. Now, Scarlett Johansson in the movie, she's more of a reciprocator. She doesn't really resist him. Whereas Rebecca Hall, she's more of a wholesome pretender. So that's a movie worth watching. Um, Closer. Ooh. 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 If you haven't seen Closer, ooh. Man, you got to watch Closer. Particularly the, the, the scenes that involve Clive Owens' character and Julia Roberts' character. Ooh. You know, that movie got nominated for both an Oscar and a Golden Globe. Matter of fact, Clive Owen won a Golden Globe for that movie, as well as uh, Natalie Portman, I think, won a Golden Globe for that movie. That's a good movie, man. Particularly, it deals with two couples. One couple is Natalie Portman and um, what's the guy from Sherlock Holmes? Jude Law. Jude Law and Natalie Portman are one couple that are having some dysfunction. And then the other couple is Clive Owen and Julia Roberts are having dysfunction. Man, there's, there's one scene with Clive Owen and <laughs> Julia Roberts in that movie. <sighs> Worth the price of admission. He, when he, man, the, the scene where Clive Owen first finds out that Julia Roberts has been cheating on him behind his back and he goes off on her man that 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 scene is priceless that scene is fucking priceless um think of the other movies that that relate um I'll tell you a movie, I don't know if this movie deals with themes in my books or even themes in my video podcast, but it's just a, a damn good movie. It was, I want to say, Stanley Kubrick's either last or next to last movie he ever did before he died. If you're into the entertainment industry, I, I, I hope you know, man. I, I don't know if some of you know, but I know some people tease me. They say, oh, you always talk about movies, man. You know, before I became a dating coach, I was pursuing a career in the entertainment industry. I, I think most of you know that, but for those few that don't know that, if you look at my Wikipedia page, you'll see. That's, that's what I was pursuing, man, before I became a dating coach. Like, I never really aspired to be a dating and relationships expert or book author or dating coach. My, all my initial career aspirations in my 20s, and most of my 30s were related to the entertainment industry. I wanted, Initially, I wanted to be an actor. I did stand-up comedy for a little over a year. I pursued a career as a, a, a movie executive and a television executive. Then later, I pursued a career as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. Um, that's why I lived in Los Angeles, because I was pursuing a career in the entertainment industry. So, yeah, man, I've been a movie buff my whole life. I mean... That's my biggest love next to stuff related to dating relationships is like me and my brother, we almost used was going to do videos back a few years ago because me and my brother both, we love movies, man. And, and some friends of ours have suggested that we do a YouTube version of like Cisco and Ebert where we would break down movies and give our reviews of movies. But yeah, man, I love movies, man. That's like my biggest pastime hobby, man, is, is watching movies. Um... But I was going to say another movie I would recommend, Eyes Wide Shut. Man, that movie's so layered and so deep, it's going to fuck some of y'all up, man. That movie's almost too deep for some of y'all, man. Eyes Wide Shut, man. Man. <laughs> man, i tell you one simple scene from that movie. There's a lot of deep scenes in that movie. But here's one scene where Tom Cruise is talking to his real-life wife, Nicole Kidman, who at the time he filmed that movie was his real-life wife, and she's also his wife in the movie. Man, he's, I can't remember his dialogue, but he said something to her to the effect of, 
they're talking about the prospect of both of them cheating. And he says to her essentially that I could have cheated on you, but the reason I haven't is because I love you. And she just starts laughing hysterically, man. <laughs> she starts laughing hysterically. And she goes on to tell him, number one, she laughs at the idea of true love. And you know how I'm kind of, I ain't going to totally slam the concept of true love. Because I, I know couples that have experienced what what I would, what most people would categorize as true love. But I'm not the biggest fan of that whole true love shit. Anyway, Nicole Kidman's character basically laughs at Tom Cruise for talking about true love. And she goes on to tell him, she's like, I'm paraphrasing her words, of course. She she doesn't actually say this, but essentially what she says to Tom Cruise in that movie, she's like, motherfucker, do you know how much dick I get offered to me on like a daily basis? Like, I could cheat on you like five times a day, every day if I wanted to. That's what she basically tells him, like, motherfucker... And that's true of any really attractive, sexy woman, man. Women got so much dick that's thrown at them on a, on a weekly, if not daily basis. But that's a deep movie, man. Eyes Wide Shut. I could do a whole five-hour YouTube video on just that movie alone. That's how deep that movie was. That's how deep that movie was. And damn, I went over an hour. I didn't want to go over an hour. Um, here's the final movie I would close out on. Final movie I would recommend. Now, there's two more movies I would recommend. Um, dude, I was talking about movies about men getting played by a manipulative woman. And you know, I always talk about women being manipulative. Oh, you got to watch Body Heat. Got to watch Body Heat, man. With William Hurt and Kathleen Turner. Ooh. Ooh. Here's another movie where I'm going to say the end is going to fuck you up. The end of that movie is going to fuck you up, man. <laughs> Some of y'all should watch that movie. Because after y'all watch that movie, y'all be like, okay, I'm going MGTOW. <laughs> A lot of y'all going to be like, I'm going MGTOW after watching that movie. Body Heat, man. Then the final movie, last but not least. Last but not least. Here's a movie that when I saw it in the movie theater, that movie fucked me up. This movie fucked me up, man. This movie fucked me up, man. I couldn't believe this movie actually got made until I realized it was the, the, the woman who wrote the book and later the screenplay was a woman. I'm telling you this right now. This movie, this last movie, it's called Gone Girl. Gone Girl stars Ben Affleck. Man, if you haven't seen Gone Girl, you need to watch that motherfucking movie before the week is over. If you haven't seen Gone Girl, man, man, I'm telling you right now, if a man had written that movie, the screenplay or story for that movie, I would say nine times out of ten, that movie would have never saw the light of day. That movie would have never saw the light of day. You talking about the ultimate movie about how calculating and manipulative women can be. Well, now I got to throw in another movie. Another movie is Pretty Persuasion with uh, Evan Rachel Wood. That's a movie that shows you women's highly calculating and manipulative nature. But, um, Man, Gone Girl? Man, to me, man, that movie, when you think about the Me Too movement, man, that movie, man, dude, that movie, that movie fuck you up, man, Gone Girl, if you haven't seen it. Hopefully, two-thirds of y'all have seen that movie. But Gone Girl, man, now, I'm going to tell you one thing seen from that movie that kind of was profound, man, is when Ben Affleck, he's going to do this like TV interview 
about his wife. His wife goes missing or he thinks she's gone missing, but really she's not. Um, he wants to dog her out on camera. And, and Tyler, man, to me, this is one of Tyler Perry's best roles he ever played. It might be, matter of fact, Chris Rock said this on Twitter. Chris Rock basically said on Twitter one time, he said, I love Tyler Perry in the movie Gone Girl more than I love Tyler Perry in his own movies that he produces himself. Man, Tyler Perry plays this, like, very media-savvy attorney. And he breaks it down to Ben Affleck, man. And it, again, this kind of, to me, indirectly relates to the whole Me Too movement and all these sexual alle allegations of sexual misconduct and sexual harassment, this type of stuff. I don't remember exact words, so of course I'm a paraphrase. But essentially what Tyler Perry tells Ben Affleck, he says, man, you don't ever want to dog out women in the media. And Ben Affleck is basically like, why not? If a woman, you know, Ben Affleck's attitude is if a woman's fucked up, she's fucked up. He's like, no, nah, you don't understand media and you don't understand the general public. He basically tells a man, whenever there's a story that has to do with some controversy between a man and a woman, the media is always going to take the woman's side. They're always going to take the woman's side. Unless the woman just did something like super duper duper fucked up. If, if if the criticism against each other are roughly equal, the media is always going to favor women, as well as the general public is always going to take a woman's side. Why do you think I, that's part of what contributed to me doing that video called Face to Facts, Women Are uh, Winning the So-Called Gender War? I agree with Tyler Perry's character, what he said in that movie, man. He was like, man, the media and the general public ain't never going to side with men. If it comes to a situation where a man and a woman are having differences with each other, they ain't gonna never side with the men. I mean, nowadays you might have guys who are MGTOW or something like that that might side with you, some of your complaints of women, but the mainstream media rarely, if ever, is gonna side with men. They're gonna always give women the benefit of the doubt. The general public is gonna always give women the benefit of the doubt. And no movie brings those facts home better than Gone Girl, man. Gone Girl. Man, that movie's a motherfucker. I saw that movie like three times at the movie theater. I know women who walked out of that movie. Like, I got a high school classmate. She said she didn't even, she walked out of that movie. There's a few women on social media who said they, they who went to see that movie, they said they walked out on it. I mean, women, that movie exposed how calculating and, and, and manipulative women can be to the highest degree. More, than, I would say arguably more than any movie I've ever seen with the possible exception of Body Heat and Pretty Persuasion. So on that note, I'm going to end my, my recommendation of movies. Again, I probably ain't going to do another free video this week, so unlike last week, yeah, you, you guys probably won't see me until next Monday. Um, I'm probably going to do, 90% chance I am going to do a live stream on Thursday, a Patreon exclusive live stream on Thursday. More than likely, it'll either be at 4 o'clock Eastern or 5 o'clock Eastern. One of those two. I'll keep you posted through Patreon. Take care. Mo one, baby. Go out and make some shit happen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yeah. You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How seductive your intonations are. The vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice. How you could make her pussy so wet. 
just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king. 